Hello loving parents. So today we're going to be talking about how to create rituals and think out of the box so that morning and bedtime routines can become smooth and connected and life-giving instead of incredibly draining. It's possible and we'll discuss some ways to make this shift and help you transform those times. And one of the things that can be helpful is working with someone individually to just notice what parts of you are coming in uh, the foreground that might be in the way of your calm, confident, connected, compassionate approach to your child in the mornings and evenings. There's so many different parts of us that might be coming up. Uh, and that's very individualized. So I just encourage you to speak to somebody individually to walk you through what particular triggers are coming up for you, areas of re-stimulation, kind of when we're having a big feeling in the moment that might have deep roots in our own past. Um, and this can be very helpful and important to get that individualized care and connection for you on your journey of self-discovery that parenthood affords. In addition to that, there are some tools that can be very helpful. And one of the things that we'll be talking about today is the importance of thinking about our children's behaviors like the very tip of the iceberg. So the very tip of the iceberg, this is the water line here. That's the water line. And the very tip of the iceberg is the part of the iceberg that we can see above the surface, but it's really only about 5% of what's happening. There's so much going on beneath the surface. And so the 5% here represents our children's behaviors that we see that typically are very frustrating for us, but it's helpful to, to use non-judgmental terms to refer to them so we can call those behaviors off-track behaviors. And what's helpful, because this usually gets about 95 or 100% of our attention, but what's helpful is to think about what's driving that off-track behavior. We might not always know, but often it has to do with unmet needs, unprocessed feelings, and unsolved problems. I'm not sure if you can see this down here. Unmet needs, unresolved feelings, and unsolved problems. And when we are having a hard time in the morning at night, it usually revolves around some sort of a power struggle. There's usually some butting of heads. You want the kid to do one thing. The kid does not want to do that thing. So you're saying, yes, do it. And they're saying no. And that causes this power struggle. And the important thing to know about a power struggle is that both parties end up feeling very hurt when there's a power struggle, very unseen and very frustrated and disconnected. So this power struggle is in a very tight, small box. It creates a lot of tension. It's very hard for both parties. And we're gonna be thinking out of the box. So we keep doing the same thing, typically getting frustrated that our child isn't catching on, that this is what we want them to do. Some of the needs here though, are the need for power and the need for safety, a sense of safety. Some of the feelings tend to be Kids often feel disempowered when they're constantly being told what to do, even though they're very young. They still have a need for autonomy, so that's another need, is a need for autonomy and empowerment. And they can be feeling disempowered. They can also be feeling scared. When we get very tense and tight, we might get louder and our faces might look stern and kind of scary to little kids. So we don't realize how much power we have. We don't realize how much force we have and how scared and anxiety provoking our words, our body language, our facial expressions can be for little kids. So the other, um, and these are can be all connected, um, an unsolved problem might be that our children need us to think really well about how to create routines so that they can feel more empowered and less scared. They also might be having a problem with the language we're speaking because we're often asking our three-year-olds and four-year-olds and ten-year-olds to speak our language and we're forgetting that it's so important to speak their language. How can we expect them to speak our language when we've forgotten that they have a language all their own 
and one of those languages that they speak is the language of play. So let's think out of the box. Let's think about some interventions and we're gonna have a whole toolbox of tools to draw from hopefully many you haven't thought of before or maybe have thought of before but haven't tried yet so that we can have some great ideas for how to get out of this power struggle box, this tiny little box there. So we're gonna be thinking about how to meet the needs, the feelings and solve some of these problems. So the first intervention I'd like to talk about is the benefit of sitting down together at a calm time. And you've maybe printed out some pictures if the child's very, very young, or you can ask the child to draw some pictures or take pictures around the room if they're a little bit older. Um, and take pictures of different phases of the morning routine and bedtime routine. And then together, you can have the child put them in order. You can do that collaboratively. Again, we want to help them feel empowered. So having them put them in an order that makes sense to them and then putting some times next to them, deciding that together, how much time do you think is needed for this and what order do you think is helpful for that? And then paste that somewhere uh, where the child can see it easily. So lower, maybe on the refrigerator, not at the very top, but on the lower part of the refrigerator so the child can see it regularly. Maybe it's at a few different places around the house, in the bathroom, in the bedroom, or in the fridge. So one of the first things we're gonna encourage you to do to help with morning and bedtime is create a schedule together. And then instead of saying, no, you need to be doing this now, or you need to brush your teeth, you need to brush your teeth, you need to brush your teeth, you can say, you can play a little dumb, like, hmm, I wonder what you're supposed to do first after you're all ready, to, you know, all done with your dinner and you've read your book. Now, ah, what comes next? So you can have your child reference the schedule instead of you being the one telling your child what to do, which can be so hard for the little ones. So create a schedule with pictures. So the second intervention is two positive choices. So let's say you're in the living room or the family room and you want to have your child go into the bathroom to brush their teeth and they're saying no and this isn't working. They're in the power struggle. So to think out of the box and say, I know, let's become some sort of animal tonight. What do you want to do on the way to the bathroom? Do you want to become a horse or do you want me to become a camel? And you can ride on the back. Which one would you like to ride, a horse or a camel? So just entering their language a little bit, speaking their language of play and imagination and making that road and path to the bathroom a little more fun. Uh, if, you know, they're really not wanting to go to the bathroom, even if you offer two positive choices, then you can try something called a playful limit where you count to a certain number. Deadlines are helpful even for us as adults. Many people at the workplace know that just saying, you know, I want that report, well, fine, but, you know, it might not get done unless we say, I want that report by Friday. So similarly, kids can benefit from having a countdown or a deadline. Typically at the end of a countdown or a deadline though, scary things happen like uh, I'm going to be upset with you or you're going to get this taken away or um, even I'm going to yell. So instead with a playful countdown, we are going to become connected, silly, laughy, kissy um, kind of embodiments. So maybe it's a raspberry blower, um, for instance. So this says a playful limit counting down to 10 as a raspberry blower. So by the time I count to 10, I'm gonna give raspberries like this. I'm gonna blow little raspberries all over you. If you're not in the bathroom by 10, here I go. One, I hope you get in the bathroom soon. Two, so it's fun and it's cute and then nine oh here comes the raspberry blower ten and there's a little chasing and there's a little running away it's helpful not to overpower the child in this situation but get close and then miss and then eventually land some raspberry kisses on their little body but kind of make it hard for you to get there playfully hold back a little bit so they don't feel too disempowered again you don't want to disempower them in this playful experience and engagement but we can say if they say, stop kissing me, we can say, now start brushing your teeth and I'll stop blowing my raspberry kisses on you. So there's something they can do. It's base. Base is brushing their teeth. 
okay or putting on their clothes or whatever is putting on their shoes whatever is next you can also make it fun uh, by setting up a little speaker or just taking a phone a smartphone into the bathroom and playing an audiobook while they're brushing their teeth that they only get to listen to when they're brushing their teeth or putting on their clothes. So make it fun with some music that they love or a story that they get to listen to. It doesn't have to be so heavy and tight and tense. Another wonderful thing that's helpful for children who have a hard time brushing teeth or changing clothes, whether it's in the morning or night, is to switch roles. Again, so these are all, the pink ones are all kind of the language of play. So, and empowerment, but play. So this is playful where um, in hand-in-hand -hand parenting, we call this play listening, where the parent takes the goofy and competent role and the child's the one who kind of coaches the parent through. So we take the issue of not wanting to brush teeth or not wanting to put clothes on and we plop it into the parent and then the child can see it outside of themselves and can kind of laugh at the parent, parents not able to do it and can coach the parent a little bit. So for instance, how about tonight, instead of me brushing your teeth, my two or three year old, you brush my teeth. I'll be the kid and you be the mom. And so the child takes the toothbrush and we're like, no, I don't want that, I don't want, oh, I don't know. And then the child brushes our teeth and we object because it's really uncomfortable and unpleasant. And the child will feel more empowered. And often after they laugh and brush our teeth, they'll be more willing to let us brush theirs. And of course, giving them the message that pretty soon they'll be able to do it themselves and go ahead and give it a try. Let me see if you can. And then celebrating them and, and being in awe of them if they're ready. Even if all of these wonderful things are offered, you still might have to find a way to just calmly set a confident, clear limit. So we call this a calm, confident limit. And I think about it as being water to their rock. If you're calm and consistent and just stay neutral, water can, through its steady and steadiness and consistency, move rock. So just getting really grounded, really present, come down to their level, connect with them, look in their eyes. So you can say, sweetie, can I see your eyes? Let me see your eyes. Let me have your hands, honey. <gasps> there you are. I see you. It's time. It's time. So it's just calm, confident, connected limit. And then just keep saying, it's time. No, 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 no. Yeah, it's time. So we're not, what are we not doing there? We're not getting hooked into content. We're not answering a lot of their questions. We're not getting into a debate. We're not trying to convince them why. We're not answering why a lot. Maybe a short, simple answer. And then just coming back to, it's time, my love. It's time. So it's warm. It's connected. It's simple. It's two or three words, tops. And just repeating that so we don't have to use as much brain power and we get to feel our warmth and kindness oozing out of our pores and out of our eyes it feels better versus when we get stuck in this small box of the power struggle the last thing i'll um, share with you in terms of a tool is a tool again from hand in hand parenting that's called special time and this is before all of this is done so special time is a set amount of time so you can start with 10 minutes, 15 minutes, maybe even 20 minutes where your child gets to direct the play fully. And we bring our full enthusiasm and delight and we just get to be in awe of what our child would like to play. We get curious and we set that timer so that we can bring our 100% enthusiasm, which is hard to do 24 seven and shouldn't be expected because that would give the child a false sense of power, which we don't want them to have all the time. But in this short little amount of time, they can feel totally empowered. And then when that timer goes off, they might have strong feelings that we can listen to. But then it is time for us to be the one inviting them through all of our tools to do what's needed to be done. And that does tend to help connect us with our children because we're speaking their language again. This is going back to speaking their language pictures structure that's in their language but also giving them their time to play and make all the choices so that they can enter our world again a little bit more and listen to our choices uh, there's also the issue of in 
anxiety that comes up, especially at night, but also in the morning if the child's going off to school or daycare. And I encourage you to look at our video on anxiety and separation anxiety. Feel free to reach out at Jacqueline at mcaft.com if you have any questions. That's J-A-C-L-Y-N at mcaft.com. Stands for Mindful Child and Family Therapy. Thanks so much. Take good care. Have fun in the mornings and night. You need it and the children need it too. Be well.